Okay, all right, we're ready to go. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our second Lunch and Learn webinar of the series so far, of the four we're doing this spring. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to attend this webinar. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me too pretty well, and the echo in this room isn't uh, horrible. It's not the best, however, either. Um, so today's topic, we're going to be talking about designing mobile-friendly online courses uh, for your use in e-class. However, a lot of these principles are also going to apply to any sort of online course uh, you might work on or develop in the future. A couple of starting uh, notes. Uh, first off, this webinar is being recorded uh, for posterity's sake. Um, this is so we can share it with people in the future that might not have been able to attend today, um, as well as have a record for ourselves. Um, we will send you a link to this recording with some other resources, a how-to guide after the webinar has ended. Uh, you don't need to worry about your microphone or your webcam at all during this webinar. Um, it's just going to be uh, me speaking, and if you need to uh, ask any questions, we'll have time at the end of the presentation where you could uh, use the chat box, as you've already used, to enter any questions or concerns or thoughts you may have uh, after the webinar. Uh, I'm your facilitator today. My name is Nick Middlebrook. I'm the Instructional Technology Specialist here at the Office of Online Learning. Um, if you've called the office before, you probably had a 50-50 chance of speaking to me at some point. Um, you're going to get some lovely take-home prizes today from this webinar. Uh, when we conclude, I'll send all participants a copy of this specific PowerPoint presentation, a link to the, this video as it is recorded, and a how-to guide outlining how to do some of the various things we're going to touch on today throughout this presentation. So you get something to take home with you, so to speak. OK, so let's begin with asking the question of why we should design our courses to be mobile friendly. Our friends over at Google released a comprehensive report in 2012 titled The New Multi-Screen World. It's a great report. Uh, you can find it. Just do a quick Google search for it, and you can find it online. I uh, highly recommend reading it if you spend any time teaching online or plan to spend any time teaching online or hybrid online courses. But the idea, the takeaway phrase from this report that they presented was, smartphones are the backbone, backbones excuse me, of daily media interactions. I think we'll see by the end of this presentation that this statement holds true for online learning. Uh, Google is referring not just specifically to smartphones, but they're using the word in a broader sense to encompass things such as Android smartphones, iPhones, um, tablets such as the iPad, uh, Samsung tablets, um, and even such ebook readers as Kindle Fires um, that are a little more enhanced than your regular ebook reader. So let's start off with what? The question of what is mobile learning? We're going to use this word mobile both in terms of something that is portable or on the go in sort of, you know, like a mobile. Your car is mobile, or you are mobile, right? As well as a shorthand for the devices that we use day to day. Um, quickly going out of style is the term mobile phone. Now it's a smartphone. But for the last you know, 15 years or so of cell phones, we refer to them more or less as mobile phones. So the word mobile has two meanings when we use it in this context. Um, what is mobile learning? Um, a simple definition is it, something that it's, it's an approach to learning that lets students benefit from interacting with their course content using devices they're already using to connect with every other aspect of their lives. If you've spent any time in front of a classroom of, of students, you, you know that those are always within inches of their, of their reach um, and oftentimes in front of their face. And it's very possible that you have a smartphone next to you right now uh, within inches of your reach. <clears throat> Generally speaking, there's two forms of mobile learning. There's uh, the inside the classroom format, sort of a traditional education format, where it's a regular classroom setting, and the student brings their device to the classroom at the behest of the teacher um, in order to enable some sort of synchronous learning or be used as a resource as guided by the teacher in the classroom. Um, I come from a high school background, and I did that oftentimes in my courses, um, would it be teaching my students, having them use some sort of smart device um, on the side throughout the classroom period. 
The other form is the what we see here more at Mount St. Mary College and in online learning, this outside the classroom form of mobile learning. Um, this supports both synchronous and asynchronous learning and often uh, is referred to or supports the flipped classroom model. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's a model where students generally do the lecture for homework first and then the classroom time spent for discussion and analysis of the lecture. So it's sort of a flip-flop. The homework is the lecture, the lecture is the homework, so to speak. So why mobile learning? Why do we want to embrace this? Why is it important to us as educators? Well, mobile is no longer the future. It's the reality, reality of today. Gone are the days of, you know, maybe your more tech-savvy friend had a smartphone, but you were still using a flip phone. These days, almost everybody has a mobile phone. Uh, I, I use my mother as a very good example of someone I would never expect to have a smartphone and now loves using it. Um, you know, it's gotten to the point where she can use this, um, not being a very tech-savvy person herself. No offense to my mother. Um, and statistically, smart devices are now used by more than, are yet, excuse me, are now used more than any other computing device out there. Uh, you have children who can't type on a keyboard, but they can use a smartphone. A lot of this has to come into the fact that they are very all-in-one, user-friendly devices. Um, years ago, you still had to have some technology expertise or knowledge to be able to use um, a smartphone or to be able to use a computer you know, outside of just checking email and going to websites. Smartphones have really bridged that gap between usability and functionality, um, which is why we're seeing more and more non-traditional technology users embracing this technology. Just think a few years ago, we used to carry around maybe a voice recorder to record notes or lectures, a digital camera to take pictures of what we were doing throughout the day or for our work, an iPod to listen to music, um, a GPS device to find our way, uh, you know, either um, driving on streets or, you know, in a traditional GPS say, for hiking or something like that. Nowadays, our phones can do all of those things and more without having to carry around disparate devices, worry about separate batteries, what needs to be plugged in, all that fun we used to deal with just years ago. And a lot of schools and workplaces are implementing these new initiatives um, to really embrace this technology as it comes into our culture. A lot of K-12 schools have gone the one-to-one -one route, meaning that each student is given a device as part of their curriculum that accompanies and enhances their classroom learning. Uh, there's some schools in this area that have actually done that with varying degrees of success. You can imagine that impl implementation is, is really key here. And a lot of workplaces have also implemented a BYOD or a bring your own device initiative, meaning that, um, <coughs> excuse me, I see if we have some new people entering. Hello, everybody that just entered. Uh, bring your own device initiative, meaning that you can bring your own laptop, your own computer to work and use that to accomplish your work tasks. Um, if you're an adjunct here at the school, you're not given a laptop at this time, but you can use your own device to accomplish the work you need to do here for Mount St. Mary College. So we are already doing this as an institution. And your smartphone, you might not think of it as a device, but it is a device and we are using these devices and allowed to use these devices on our uh, campus network. Let's take a look at a few crucial statistics regarding online learning and the usage of mobile devices. So from 2014 to 2015, the number of students taking online courses grew 3.9%, which is interesting because in that same time period, 2014 to 2015, overall enrollments in higher education actually decreased. So even though higher, edu higher education has taken a slight hit in the last few years, which is understandable with economic uh, things that are occurring in our country right now and just the natural ebb and flow of how people learn and how people go through these systems, online programs are continually to, continuing to increase in their enrollment numbers. And in fact, in the 2015 academic year, 28% of all United States students took at least one online course. And you can expect that number to grow as we move far further into the future. So it's quite possible that everyone present today in this webinar owns at least one smart device and a computer of some kind. Um, I'm speaking to you right now uh, with three 
different computing technologies in front of me, a Mac, a PC, and my smart device, all interacting and helping me give you this presentation. So it's not uncommon to be using multiple devices at the same time to accomplish a specific task. When we look at mobile learning specifically and how we use our devices as learners, we come across this idea called multi-screening. This report uh, I referenced earlier from Google, which I again highly recommend you read, uh, divided it into two forms. The first form, which you see here at the top of the page, is sequential usage. I'll move my little laser pointer there. For an example, it's when you move from one device to another to accomplish different tasks at different times. So say you're a student. You grab your phone. You say, oh, I want to see if I have homework due in my sociology class today. So I take my mobile phone. I go to e-class. And I say, oh, yep, I have uh, to write a response to this paper and take this online quiz. So I know right then and there that, OK, I'm going to have to use my computer later to better accomplish this task. Or maybe that's what works best for me. So sequentially, I go from my smartphone and then later on use the device I feel is most appropriate, in my own personal opinion, that would be a laptop for that. Then there's this idea of simultaneous usage of devices. We're going to disregard the one here on the left, multitasking. That's sort of the idea of just using two devices at the same time, but not for any specific task. So you know, you're watching a ball game maybe in the background while reading some, a book on your phone. But the other one we're very interested in as educators, complementary usage. An uh, example of complementary usage would be a student using a mobile device, maybe a smartphone, maybe a tablet to have some research document up they're referencing or writing the paper they're working on on a laptop next to them. Or almost like having two computer screens. If you've ever used two computer screens, you can never go back to one. <laughs> Another good example of complementary usage would be using a mobile device to collect data points, say for a class in land surveying, and then using a laptop concurrently to enter those points into a spreadsheet to help create um, a plot or a graph or some sort of visual aspect of what you're trying to collect. It saves time. It's more intuitive. And especially if you're working in groups, sometimes having those two devices can really speed things up and, and increase learning potential and group work. When we look deeper at the first type of multi-screening, se sequential screening that we mentioned in the last slide, we find that across the board, smartphones are used first and foremost as the primary device. And then users move on to a secondary device, usually a PC, based on the research from Google from 2012. There's a lot of information on this infographic here. Um, but, but the general idea is that most people start on a smartphone and then if they need to continue that task elsewhere, if they can't accomplish it on that smartphone or smart device, then they move on to a PC. Very rarely do they move on to a tablet. And if you've ever used a lot of tablets and smartphones, that makes sense because they are very similar. A tablet is really a smartphone with a larger screen, at least as the current technology trends are going. The main idea here is that we as smart device users, as a society of smart device users, have this general sequence we take to access information, as well as work with that information. So as course designers and educators, we need to structure our courses with this in mind. There's that quote again, that smartphones are the backbone of daily media interactions. It was really the main point of that Google report. And then this will be the last slide on that Google report. But interestingly enough, even though these smartphones are the backbones, they're not the be all end all of our daily media interactions. That's why I really like that term they used here, backbone. When we look at how long we generally spend on each device per interaction, it turns out that we spend the least amount of time on smartphones. This makes sense as we tend to use it as our first device, our go-to device. It's in our pocket. How could it not be our go-to device? But it also ties into the size of the screen. Smartphones are usually the smallest in terms of screen size. And the comfort of using the device. I know that looking down at my smartphone after a while, my neck, you know, I get smartphone neck you know, in my spine. And I want to look at a slightly larger screen. Um, and I also have, you know, I wear glasses probably from looking at screens my entire life. So it is more comfortable for me to use a larger screen at this point in my life. And also, things such as laptops and PCs have keyboards built in. 
you can have a keyboard, a tablet that comes with a keyboard or has a Bluetooth keyboard. But generally speaking, if I'm going to begin writing or typing out lengthy responses um, or editing something, I don't want to use my smartphone for that. It's very hard to edit on a smartphone. So that's where really the PC or the laptop comes into play. And that, therefore, it makes more sense that we're using our PC and our laptops at, for longer lengths of time to accomplish the tasks we need to accomplish. Okay, so enough statistics. Uh, let's talk briefly about some of the conceptual background and ideas behind utilizing mobile learning and smart devices as part of this overall online or hybridized online educational experience. The big picture idea here is this concept of using mobile devices to complement your courses, not replace. To complement your course and not replace other devices as well. You don't want to design a course to just use only smartphone. You wouldn't want to design a course in this day and age only to be used on a tablet. There wouldn't be any point in doing so because nobody's going to interact with it that way and it could become frustrating for people on other devices. So let's take a look at some main ideas to keep in mind as we begin designing our courses to be mobile friendly. And as a side note, um, these are also just generally good online course design techniques. Um, a lot of what we're going to speak about today don't only apply to mobile-friendly online courses, but actually apply to just online courses as a general um, concept. And I think you'll see at the end of uh, the presentation why that makes a little more sense. So first and foremost, with any education, you want to understand your students. You want to know what style of learning they used, uh, excuse me, utilized best. Are they audio visual learners? Are they more the type of person that likes to read? Like any education, you want to you know, suit your teaching styles to be as, most, as diverse as possible and to suit all the students that you have. You also want to understand their technology base. What are they working with? Are they smartphone only? Do they have PCs? Do they have Macs? Do they have older technology? You want to know what they're working with um, before you begin to design your courses so you know what, what to expect and where everybody stands. Know this. It's, <clears throat> excuse me. Know this. Students are going to use mobile devices for learning with or without you planning for it. In fact, they're probably already using this in your courses. They're probably using their phones from time to time to check on things in their course. You might not even know that. So plan ahead. They're going to be doing this with or without you know, being on board with it. They have the access to it on their phone. They're going to use their phone first. Students need to be able to quickly find information. Again, 17 minutes maximum time spent per interaction on a smartphone. I should be able to find any information for my coursework in less than five minutes and hopefully less than three minutes so that the rest of that time spent on that phone perhaps could be used to interact with that information that I've pulled from that course. And again, we're going to keep coming back to this smartphones are the backbone idea. But if they're the backbone of daily media, daily media interactions, then our course design should start there as well. Here's a couple of quick things mobile learning is not or is not meant to be. Again, it's not a replacement for desktop or laptop learning. It's meant to complement desktop laptop learning. It's sort of a, at this point in technology, it's a package deal. You can't just force people to learn on desktops or laptops anymore, and you can't force them to just use smartphones. So you have to plan in advance to sort of use all these things as a coherent whole. And if you think about it, you're already doing that in some ways. It's not a one-stop shop. Your phone can't do everything, just like your PC can't do everything. Different tools are better suited for different tasks. Smartphones and smart devices are currently not ideal for building and editing courses. Um, I would say the progression of hardest to easiest would be mobile to tablet to desktop. Very hard to edit things on a mobile phone. Tablets, a little easier because you have more screen real estate and you can sort of interact with it um, in an easier way. And desktops are still what I would consider to be the go-to way of designing your course from the get-go. Again, complement, not replace. That's the main idea here of our mobile learning strategy. So now that we've talked about 
why it's worth designing our courses to be mobile friendly, let's touch on a few of the benefits of mobile friendly design before we move on to some specific examples of uh, best practices and some ideas of how you can use uh, this design to enhance your courses going forward. <clears throat> so first and foremost, mobile friendly design allows your course to be accessed from any device, anytime, anywhere in the world. Really, the entire lear student learning experience is extended. It allows students to extend learning into non-traditional places, such as the train, the metro, cafes. Maybe you're st stuck babysitting for a weekend without a computer handy, but you could still get some work done, as well as shorter periods of downtime. You know, I might not write an essay if I have 15 minutes free between classes, but it's very possible I might check to see what sort of assignments I have coming up this week or the status of some submitted assi uh, assignments to see if something was graded. So it allows students to stay engaged in smaller chunks throughout the day with their learning. Same goes for the teacher. Let's not forget the teachers here, right? As a teacher, you can now post announcements throughout the day. If you think of something, you know, lying in bed at night that you need to tell your students really quickly, you can do so without having to get up and go log onto a machine and all that, all that fun. You can check submission statuses just like the students do. You know, see your people are having a hard time maybe with the instructions. It allows for more instantaneous feedback outside of just email for knowing what's going on in your course and how things are going at the given time. And it generally just allows you to interact with your course as a teacher when convenient. You know, it's very hard to schedule out an hour every day to work on a single course. Our schedules in this day and age are just very chaotic for most people. So this allows you to interact when you have the time, when it's easiest for you, and allows you to interact with the device that works best at that given time. If you look at the second bullet there, smartphones are just better at certain tasks. Again, we don't carry around digital cameras much anymore. Maybe if you have an SLR, you might. But for the most part, we don't carry around digital cameras. We don't carry around voice recorders because they're cumbersome. And you had to save the data off them onto a computer. There was a lot of steps involved in the process of getting that data from one place to another. They, they're, again, they're a one-stop shop for a lot of things. They're better at capturing video. They're better at capturing audio. They're better at taking pictures. I don't even have a digital camera anymore. I just use my phone, right? And they have these built-in apps that are user-friendly that can handle a lot of what you used to have to do manually. Previously, if I took a picture with a camera, I'd have to save it, resize it to a smaller file size, shrink it so it fit on the website, and then upload it. 20 steps easily, you know, from clicks at least, from start to finish to get to where I needed to go. Now, I can take a picture of my camera, upload it to my course, and it's there, and it works, and that's it. And I maybe clicked or touch my screen three to four times. That's the beauty of smartphones. They take a lot of this converting and resizing and just tedium out of the equation, which of course is why they're so user friendly. And something to think about going forward, anything your phone can do can be part of your course, either assignments or just activities. This isn't just built in apps that come with your phone, but also free apps. If you're into hiking, you could literally, you could have students create a map or a course using one of the um, tracking, GPS tracking maps. The amount of things you could do with photos, photo journals, um, you know, GPS tagging of photos, heart rate monitors that are built into phones these days, especially for our nursing students and nursing teachers, comes in handy. Social media, that's a whole other webinar in itself, but social media can actually be a good thing um, in, if used in creative and you know, correct ways for your class. QR codes, scavenger hunts. You can imagine the amount of things you could do with free technology. Anybody can access and download onto their smart devices these days um, and how that can be used in your course. OK, so before we get into sort of the nuts and bolts of this webinar, how do you ac access eClass Mobile? Well, it's really, really simple. You just take any device outside of a laptop or a PC, and you point it to eClass. Um, the direct link to that is always eclass2.msmc.edu, or you can always go through the MSMC portal and access it in that way by clicking on the, the link for eClass. And then it'll load on your phone or on your tablet, just like it would, just like it looks pretty much on the desktop. So while there is an incredible amount of
versatility and ways to utilize mobile devices in your course design, we're going to go through a few basic best practices and ideas today. Uh, our focus is going to be mostly on how to make your course easy to read, how easier to find information within, and interact with as a student. That being said, like I said in the last slide, the sky is really the limit when it comes to innovative or fun or interactive ways of using your smart devices capabilities as part of your courses. I encourage you to contact myself or the Office of Online Learning if you have an idea you're looking to implement, or maybe you're just looking for some new ideas to, to spice up or enhance your classes. So let's begin with some basic best practices for your topic summaries, or in other words, the heading titles for each section of your course. So, and again, these really do apply to outside mobile. This applies to just generally good course design. You want to keep things simple and clean. You want to have easy to read fonts. The default font E-Class uses uh, is Arial, I think. Yes, it is actually. And it's a sans serif font. It's a very easy to read, standardized, easy 90 eyes font. Be very careful with your choice of colors and contrast. Uh, generally not a good idea to use backgrounds um, for your text unless it's a really distinct purpose for doing so. Keep your titles short and succinct. You want to make sure you convey the only the information that's necessary, not too much. There's other ways to do that, and we'll, we'll get into that. Utilize audio introductions. We'll speak more about that in a moment. Keep graphics to a minimum. Keep essential graphics. If you need a photo or a picture, why is it there? Do you need it there? Can it be put somewhere else? Maybe it's better placed in a larger, more expanded page of information than on your topic introduction. And generally, we recommend using the one topic course format for um, the best navigation experience on eClass Mobile. Um, the one topic format is very common. You're probably already using it. It's what we call the tabbed browsing um, format often, where you have these little gray tabs and you click on each one to bring you to a new course section. Um, if you've worked with us in the past to help build or, or modify your course, it's very likely you're already using one topic. That being said, you don't need to use one topic, but it is recommended um, from our office here. So as we go forward in this presentation uh, for the remainder of our time today, you're going to see a number of these good course, bad course, side by side comparisons that I've created for this webinar. Um, these are actually real screenshots from my own personal device, the Samsung Galaxy 5 smartphone, uh, which is comparable in screen size and general display as in a uh, modern iPhone 6. Um, as you can imagine, tablets such as iPads have a much greater amount of screen real estate and are easier on the eyes. Uh, note that both versions here have these navigation tabs, these horizontal navigation tabs that I'm outlining. You can see my um, laser pointer there for each module. That's actually what one topic format, that tab browsing format, looks like on an E-Class mobile site. So it's a very, very attractive and, and well-organized way of um, putting together your site. Uh, other formats, such as topics format, um, would be a single scrolling page, which usually isn't desirable on a mobile device, um, or a single page per topic, which actually works pretty well as well. Um, and if you're interested in either of those formats, we can help you set those up. Note that in the right-hand side image, the course titles are actually very long. They're so long that they're spilling over the boundary of that particular tab. It's actually not uncommon for instructors to have these very long, detailed um, uh, topic titles because you want to try and convey this information. You know, what's the name of the module? What week is it going to cover? But know that when it's displayed on smaller screens, such as my Samsung here, it runs over. So it's something to keep in mind when you're titling these topics. You know, less is often more, and it's always important to test as much as you can on any of the devices that you might have, such as a smartphone or a tablet, just to make sure everything looks OK. Looking further into our demonstration courses here, note how the topic um, or module title displays when it has been shortened, as you see here on the left. Um, it's a nice short display, and it's very clear what this is about. Over on the right-hand side, again, it's not overly lengthy, but it gets a little long-winded, and most likely, it's giving me too much information as to really what this module is about. Um, on the left-hand side, the size of the module is a default size, whereas on the right-hand side, right side, it's been 
uh, bumped up in size a bit, making it a little, doesn't fit quite as well on the screen. Again, oftentimes the default option in E-Class is the best option for mobile devices. So if you don't need to make the te text bigger for any specific reason, keep it the default. You also notice that the colors of the module title are highlighted uh, in attractive, easy to read colors, clearly showing that this is a module title and this should be just looked at before going further. The color of the text on the left is high contrast, just simple black and white. It's very easy to read, and the entire introduction fits on the screen. While this is not a requirement by any means, all courses, of course, have different needs, it's a good idea to only write what's necessary for your students to avoid that sort of wall of text idea, which usually gets skimmed or ignored at worst. Um, notice also there's an audio introduction present. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. Um, again, that's not a requirement by any means, um, but they're an excellent way to make your course more accessibility friendly, as well as convey information in a way that might suit different learning styles. And it doesn't necessarily need to be spoken word audio introduction. Uh, think of what you could do with a music introduction, or if you're teaching a music course in, in uh, particular, or if maybe famous speeches if you're teaching a history course. Something that can really engage and grab your learners from the get-go. You know, it's a surprise. If they don't know what's going to play when they press play, you could actually really engage a student from the very first moment of your, they look at your course. And last but not least, notice the lack of photos on what I call the good course side here, the left-hand side. Um, again, photos are a bad thing. This is a nice stock photo of a nurse on the right-hand side. But they don't always display correctly. Uh, they're a little tricky to work with. And if they're not conveying truly necessary information, maybe they belong somewhere else on your course, maybe not on a topic title page. Moving on to our next topic here, uh, best practices in chunking content. Generally, generally like uh, student loans, <laughs> you, it's a good idea to consolidate, right? You want to consolidate and group your course materials into categories and easy to find groups. Uh, students do not want to spend a long time searching for course resources, just as you don't want to spend a long time on a website looking for what you're looking for. You want to be able to find it as quickly and as easily as possible. And oftentimes, if a student can't find what they're looking for, they're going to ask you directly. Now you have emails to respond to, or they just won't do it altogether. I've seen that myself before. You obviously want to avoid this as much as possible. Um, luckily, E-Class has many different ways um, to consolidate and group together resources and information to minimize these frustrations and confusions. It's a good idea to group materials into smaller sections. Utilize the built-in folder and label functionality of E-Class to really demarcate what is what and where, what lives where. And again, just smaller pages are easier to navigate. Less is more when it comes to information. Looking at our examples here, we have on the left-hand side, um, a lot of things have been consolidated into folders. If you look down here at module notes, all the e-books have been put into one folder here. And all the notes, all the PDF form files have been put into one folder here. On this right-hand side, if I were to continue to scroll down, I would see a long list of different PDFs and PowerPoint files. That's OK, but it makes more sense for me to just put them all in one folder so that if I'm a student, I know that my, my um, chapter notes are always in one folder in the same place no matter what part of the course I'm going into. <clears throat> also, if you look at the screen on the right here, um, there's video links. There's two separate, separate video links. Same video. One has chapter one uh, video links that play through the E-Class's built-in video player. But then there's another one that has chapter one's video link that's linking to the same thing only hosted on YouTube. That's perfectly fine to host them in two different places. Um, however, it's long. It's taking up a lot of screen real estate. Instead, we put them into what we call a page, an E-Class page, which you've likely used before. And then what we'll see on the next slide here is we can embed every single video on a single page so that as a student, all I have to do is click on one link and all the videos are there listed, ready for me to click play on one single page. And I know that, hey, I got to watch chapter two's notes. Cool. And oops, what was that in chapter one? I go right back into a chapter one, same page, no navigating, no getting lost, no having multiple tabs open. <clears throat> that kind of thing. And one of the most beautiful things of sort of the modern era that we live in in streaming media 
which is great, is that we can upload videos to YouTube. And in fact, we recommend using YouTube these days um, as a video hosting service uh, for your course. Um, these videos, chapters one and two here, uh, I, were uploaded to YouTube, privately shared, so that only those in the class can access those videos. They're not public, public videos. You have that, that power to control that access. And the one nice feature is that if I were to click play here on my phone, the video would begin to play right there on that page. But if I wanted to, I could click the title here and it would open the video in the native YouTube app for my device. That's actually really beneficial um, because it optimizes bandwidth for my device and the quality um, depending on my connection type. And oftentimes the YouTube app says, hey, you're not on Wi-Fi. Are you sure you want to stream this video right now? So it's actually a little bit smarter um, to, do, to do use YouTube because they really are sort of the forefront of, of streaming media. And the same can be said for Vimeo. If you've ever used Vimeo as a um, streaming media service, very similar functionality. Anything YouTube can do, Vimeo can, can do as well, for the most part. Okay, moving forward onto some best practices for sharing documents and presentations. Uh, even though we're long past the era of file format and com computer compatibility issues, thank God for that, right? There are still some particular document types that work best for smartphones and tablets. And you want to ensure that anything you share with your students can be opened on any device. Um, always use common document types. PDF, if you can get it in PDF format, that's the best. It opens on any and all device that exists out there right now. And they're small, they're compressed file formats. So that you know, a large document, uh, say maybe a PowerPoint presentation that might have taken up 15 megabytes can be maybe two megabytes, three megabytes in PDF form. You can share. Microsoft Doc and PowerPoint file formats, most devices can open them these days, but oftentimes it requires additional software. And if it's a third party piece of software, the formatting might not match up. And you've probably come across that before in your own travels. Um, Google Drive is also a really interesting alternative that's slowly becoming more and more used in academia. Um, it's outside of the scope of this workshop today. Um, I would certainly like to give one in the future on that. But it exists as another tool that can be utilized. Um, if you're interested in ever utilizing Google Drive, please contact me or the Office of Online Learning and we'll help you out with that one. And one of the best parts about using PDFs, um, again, I said, if you can use PDFs, please do. Both Windows and Mac devices can PDFs natively at this point. Uh, Macs have a built-in PDF printer. Um, if you were to print a file, you can actually print directly to PDF from any version of Mac OS X or recent version in the last five years or so. And Windows, most major Windows programs such as Microsoft Word or PowerPoint can actually export natively, meaning it's built in, to a PDF format. Um, the process of how you do this, uh, when I send along the addendum to this webinar, the guide, I've outlined a process uh, in, in that guide so you can follow along those steps if you ever would like to do this yourself. Okay, moving on, let's look at some best practices for file sizes and types, as well as how to display them for your students. First off, you want to try your best to be aware of the size of the files that you're sharing. Larger files take longer to download, has always been the case. You know, we're gone from the dial-up era, which is awesome, <laughs> but even now, files can be big and connections are not always the best, even in this modern era. Larger files load slowly as well, depending on the age and the file software you're using on your device, and sometimes can behave funny as well. So you want to try and stay away from large files as a general rule of thumb. You want to try and use compressed file formats if possible. They're already optimized for size. You already have used MP3s and PDF files in your life. Um, if you ever use iTunes, you've also used MP4s, another great compressed file format. Also, gone are the days of unlimited mobile data plans. They were great, but those days are gone, right? So students don't always have Wi-Fi access depending on where they are. Um, and so if they are on data, which very often on campus or off campus they might be, it's important for a student to know, hey, here's a file my, student, my teacher has shared with me. How big is this file? What kind of file is this before I click on this link and maybe incur a 50 megabyte download charge when I'm almost out of data for that month? Luckily, eClass has a built-in feature that indicates to students how large the file is and what format that file's in. Um, again, the exact steps on how to do this will 
will be outlined in the guide. I'm going to send along to you all at the end of this presentation. But it's found in the appearance options in your edit settings page for any uploaded file resource you provide for your students. Um, it's this little display type automatic here. Um, and there's little boxes here that say show size and show type and display resource description. You always want to make sure if you're uploading a file to your course that all these boxes are checked. These two size and type are actually not checked by default. Um, so you do need to make sure you go in and manually check them for yourself. And display type automatic, that's basically telling eClass, let the device choose what it thinks is best to open this file. On a smartphone, that actually is to download the file to the device, which makes sense because if I'm sharing a, say, 3 megabyte PDF with my students, I don't want them downloading that same 3 megabyte PDF every single time they go to that class. Instead, it goes through their device once, and then they can access it any time in the future from that device going forward. Again, refer to the guide I send you for detailed information on this one. So what does it look like when we enable this? It might be a little hard to screen depend excuse me, see, depending on the size of your screen right now. But what I've highlighted out here is generally what it looks like. Um, so this file here was a PowerPoint file, research questions, hypotheses, and clinical questions. And after I enable those two options I just showed you, you can now see that it's a 988 kilobyte, which is a very small, PowerPoint presentation, whereas the file above it does not have that indication. So if I was a student and I didn't know what this little icon meant, I wouldn't know what I was downloading without this information being presented to me. It could be a huge file. I might not want to download that file. And not all students are tech savvy enough to understand the difference between large files and small files. So you want to help them out as much as you possibly can. Oh, and one thing to note for that last slide, sorry. Um, this information here, this size and type information, would display once enabled on both the desktop versions and the mobile versions of eClass, which is useful in both cases. Let's take a brief look at some best practices for using audio in your courses. Using a desktop, you need to rec use recording software such as Audacity to record audio, then export an MP3, which is very time consuming and takes a certain amount of skill and familiarity with those software programs. Phones have this unique ability to do all the recording and encoding for you, meaning all you have to do is press record and then share or upload. In fact, the very first two bullets on this slide are automatically taken care of for you by your phone. You can change them depending on your phone and the software you're using, but generally when you record, it's creating an MP3, it's using the average recommended audio quality already. No configuration on your side necessary. So it just so happens that some of the most frustrating parts of dealing with audio have been now taken care of for your phone. It's also recommended to keep the length of audio short, you know, about the length of a song, five minutes or so or less, um, to keep engagement and to not keep file sizes from getting too long. Uh, if you've ever added a L resource to your course in the past, then you're already familiar with the steps necessary to add audio and video to your course from your smartphone. Now you just go through your smartphone instead of your PC. Um, the guide, again, will outline the step-by-step -step details on how to accomplish this. But the idea is that you go to your course, you add a file resource, you choose a file picker, and then depending on your phone, you'll get the uh, action window on an Android device. Do you want to use your camera, your voice recorder? Or if you have an iPhone, one of the file picker versions, depending on what version of iOS you use. And then, just like you've seen before, anytime you upload a file to your course, it pops up, you save your changes, and now your audio, your video, your photo, whatever, or your document even, is now shared to your course, um, nice and simple. Lastly, let's take a quick look at some best practices for utilizing mobile-friendly video resources in your course. Conveniently, the method for uploading video to your course is exactly the same for audio, and it's exactly the same for any other document or photograph from your phone. So it's very standardized and simple once you get the hang of it. It's just a couple clicks and you're done. I mentioned it before, but we do recommend as a department that you use YouTube or Vimeo as your hosting site for videos. It optimizes based on device and connection. Uh, it minimizes data costs. It allows for privately shared videos, so you can have a whole plethora of videos that only you can control access to who sees them. They embed beautifully in the courses, and eClass is very, very good at doing so. 
And uh, generally, you want to keep your videos short, like audio, less than five minutes, maybe five to ten minutes at max, depending on what you're trying to share. Or break them into multiple parts so they can be digested um, and looked at in, in sections. Um, you want to provide captioning for videos if possible. That's a daunting task. Luckily, YouTube has built-in captioning. So anything you upload, it tries its best to caption it for you, which is great for accessibility concerns. And as a general rule of thumb, avoid anything Java or Flash-based. And that's just a general rule of thumb um, for any mobile learning. Uh, smartphones don't use Java. Smartphones don't use Flash. Neither do iPads or any sort of tablet. They're sort of going the way of the dodo, little by little. Um, so try to avoid them as much as possible in your classes. So as we begin to wrap up here, essentially anything a phone can do, you can potentially implement into your course. If all of your students already own some form of smart device, and of course you want to find out first, but they should at this point, then the barrier of entry is, doesn't exist any longer for these types of innovative activities and, and new media types that we can use. Just some general ideas. Podcasting. You can become a podcaster, and we, a lot of us listen to podcasts, right? Your course, you can set up an audio form that only you control, and that could be your podcast for a course. Your students could be, create podcasts for your courses. Quizzes are great on phones, on smart devices. Any class you give, any online quiz, excuse me, you give on eClass can be taken on a smart device. And the interface is actually a little bit better, if you ask me, than the desktop version of taking quizzes. Audio-based form discussions. Why not have a form? Instead of typing everything out, you just record a one-minute audio clip. And any student with a smart device can do so very quickly from their phone. Again, like we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, flip classrooms. These, the mobile learning uh, techniques we've looked at here are perfectly suited for the idea of a flipped classroom. And just a few other ideas. I won't go down the whole list. Um, that you can imagine uh, exist out there. Again, the sky is kind of the limit. Uh, just because it's not built into E-Class, E-Class has a lot of great built-in features, but just because it's not built in E-Class doesn't mean you can't do it in your class. Um, a lot of times, uh, people come and reach out to us looking, you know, they have this idea that they're just not sure to how to implement it, and that's sort of part of the reason we're here as the Office of Online Learning. So talk to us, you know, you can always meet with us anytime. Um, to help generate ideas or help find the best way to implement some idea in your course. It might be something, uh, a mobile device application that, you know, interacts in a way that we can make it work with eClass. So, <clears throat> so a few closing, closing thoughts um, before we open it up for any questions out there. Start small. Less is more. You do not have to make your mo class mobile friendly to overnight. In fact, it probably already is pretty mobile friendly. The beauty of eClass is that the mobile site tries its best to interpret anything you've already created and present it in a way that looks good and feels good for the student. But again, build with mobile in mind. Take a look at your class. Grab your tablet. Grab your smartphone. Grab both if you have to. And see what your current courses look like on those devices. And you might be surprised as to some things you might want to tweak or change. Or it might look perfect, and then you can pat yourself on the back. <laughs> Um, know your students. I know I said that at the very beginning, but know your students. Know what the kind of technology they prefer to use, and do not assume that they are tech savvy. Again, a lot of students that you teach online are going to be coming from very diverse backgrounds and ages. So your 20-something millennial isn't going to be the same in terms of technology skill as a 40-something-year-old that's getting a, a second master's degree. So don't always assume that they know what they're doing. You know, ask and, and test. Um, test your course. I know I've said it before, but as you test your course, you might find things that don't work as well on mobile devices. So always make sure to communicate that to your students. Hey, this so-and-so activity, best done on a desktop. And it's very important for students to not get frustrated with any sort of innovative or unique learning method you're trying to you know, help them with. So always test and always be in communication with your students. And again, Always check your content because your students are already doing it on mobile devices. OK, a couple quick announcements for some upcoming mobile features we expect. Um, first and foremost, uh, Moodle, Moodle Mobile. Uh, Moodle, which is what eClass is based upon, has actually created an app for any smart device. You can get it right now if you want to. It's called Moodle Mobile. Um, we're expecting full support for that uh, with the Office of Online Learning in fall this year, 2016. Um, it's very much meant for students. It's not really much of a teacher 
course building uh, app as much as it is something for the students to access their courses. It offers a standardized view on all devices. Um, it passes you seamlessly between the app and the mobile website, depending on the task that is at hand. Uh, and generally, just keep an ear to the ground um, this coming fall for information. We'll have webinars and more information as we uh, continue and to build our support for that application. Uh, if you're daring, you could, of course, try it out right now. Um, if you're interested in doing so, you can contact you, uh, contact us, excuse me, and we can help you uh, get started on that. We're also looking to implement some sort of live and recorded lecture casting. Um, so not only can you record a lecture on the computer and then easily uplo upload it for your students to view on, at their convenience, also we want to have a way to synchronously have lectures if that's something you're interested in. So that's coming down the pike as well. And generally, as we move forward with eClass, there's always going to be small tweaks and improvements to the mobile platform um, as that becomes more and more the future of how learning is accomplished. So you know, keep an ear to the ground from the Office of Online Learning, and we will certainly let you know as we hear more about those changes. Uh, lastly, just a couple of preview screens, because I know I, I just interested everybody with that Moodle mobile app. Um, sort of what it's going to look like when it's in its sort of full form. It's a very attractive, very well put together, together HTML5 based application. Um, so again, if you're interested in using it or t testing it out, please contact our office. We can help you get set up with it. Uh, we're not ready to go live with it yet, but it is coming down um, for the future for our students. And I think it's going to be something they're really going to like um, as a complement to our already existing mobile eClass site. All right, so thank you everyone for your time today. Um, if you're, I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but if you are interested in designing your or modifying your course to be more mobile friendly, um, please make an appointment uh, with myself or anyone here at Online Learning, and we would be uh, happy to provide you know any any ideas or um, assistance that we can, um, getting you on that road. Um, so now at this time we're going to open the Q and A session. If anyone has any specific questions, um, enter the uh, your question into the chat box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, and also enter your preferred email address if you're interested in uh, receiving a link to the guide as well as a copy of this specific presentation from today. Um, we'll send along and very briefly. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for uh, attending. I really appreciate it. If anyone has any questions, I will field them now. All right, no problem. If you think of anything, you can always email me. You have my email right there on the screen, actually. OK, so with no further questions, then I, again, thank you all for coming. Um, very appreciate everyone showing up for the first uh, run of this webinar. We'll definitely have this one again as we move forward, especially with Moodle. Uh, excuse me, Moodle Mobile uh, in the future. So uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And have a great afternoon.